Hello, this is for ISOL 633 at the University of the Cumberlands. Textbook is Legal Issues and Information Security, and this is Chapter 15, Computer Forensics and Investigations. Computer forensics is a scientific process of collecting and examining data stored on received from or transmitted by an electronic device. It's a demanding area of study. New technologies of stored data are created every day. People who choose to work in this area must constantly study these new technologies. They must learn how to collect and examine data from devices that use the new technology. Computer forensics is also a rapidly expanding profession. The U.S. Department of Labor estimates the higher than average job growth for the people in this career. The ch chapter introduces basic concepts about computer forensics. It also discusses the role of computer forensic examiner, finally reviews legal issues surrounding how digital evidence is gathered and used. So the learning objective of this chapter is to explain the importance of forensics examination in legal proceedings. Things that we'll cover in the chapter include what computer forensics is, what computer forensic examiner does, what the general rules for collecting, handling, and using digital evidence are, and what some legal issues regarding the seizure of digital evidence are. Key concepts we'll cover include cybercrime investigations, digital evidence, chain of custody, laws affecting collection of digital evidence, the role of computer forensic examiner. So computer forensics exam investigation. Computer forensics is a scientific process for examining data stored on, received or transmitted by electronic devices. Data examined to find evidence about an event or crime. Law enforcement uses computer forensics to investigate almost any type of crime. Computer forensics has many different names. It's also called system or digital forensics, computer forensics analysis, computer examination, data recovery, and forensics, information and forensics. These terms are used interchangeably. In this chapter will use the term computer forensics. Computer forensics examiners Uses, use specialized software and tools to collect and study data stored on various electronic devices. Evidence collected is called digital evidence or just electronic evidence. Computer forensics includes all steps through which this evidence is collected, preserved, analyzed, documented, and presented. The goal of computer forensics is to find evidence that helps investigators analyze an event or incident. So computer forensics examiners study and collect electronic data for many reasons. They don't just investigate crimes. Other computer forensic uses include individuals. People may hire computer forensic examiners to find evidence to support tort claims. They can find digital evidence about sexual harassment or discrimination. Examiners also can uncover evidence for any type of civil litigation. They also can find evidence to support a criminal defense case. The military. The military uses computer forensics to gather intelligence information to support its operations. It also uses computer forensics to prepare for and respond to cyber attacks. Organizations use computer forensics the same way the individuals use it. Computer forensic examiners also can investigate employee wrongdoing. They can look for embezzlement or theft of intellectual property or IP. They also can look for unauthorized use of information technology resources. And they can look into attempts to harm an organization's IT resources. Organization's incident response or IR program can include forensics activities. Many colleges and universities offer programs in computer forensics. Some may have forensic research programs. They also use computer forensics for the institution's own 
activities and data recovery firms. Data recovery firms use computer forensics to secure data for their clients. They also advise clients how to keep data safe from loss. So it is a computer forensic investigation. Most electronic devices hold some type of data. Computer forensics can study any of them. Potential sources of digital evidence include computer systems. This includes a laptop and desktop computers and servers. It also includes the hardware and software that the system uses. This category also includes peripheral devices that can be attached to computer systems. These devices enhance the user experience. They may include keyboards, microphones, web cameras, and memory card readers. Storage devices. This includes internal and external hard drives. Also includes removable media such as floppy disks, zip disks, compact disks, or CDs, digital versatile disks or DVDs, thumb flash drives, and memory cards. Mobile devices. This includes cell phones and smartphones. It also includes tablets, personal digital assistants, and pagers. GPS devices hold data as well. Digital and video cameras and audio and video multimedia devices also fall into this category. Networking equipment. This includes network hubs, routers, servers, switches, and power supplies. Network equipment can be wired or wireless. Other potential sources. Uh, the may, many office devices have data storage ability. This includes copiers and fax machines, answering machines, printers, and scanners. Entertainment devices store data as well. It includes digital video recorders, digital audio recorders, video game systems. Surveillance equipment is included in this category. This category includes many devices not already mentioned and can store data. Media analysis focuses on collecting and examining data stored on physical media. This includes computer systems and storage devices. It also includes mobile devices. If people think about computer forensics, they most often think about media analysis. This type of analysis discovers normal and deleted data. It also files encrypted, hidden, and password protected data. This chapter focuses mostly on media analysis concepts. These concepts apply to other types of computer forensic analysis as well. Code analysis focuses on reviewing programming code. It's also called malware forensics. This area looks for malicious code or signatures from viruses, worms, and trojans. It looks for the signature of anything that has modified the system without permission. A signature is an executable part of a malicious code. The need for code analysis continues to grow. A 2003 report estimated that 96 new types of malware are created every minute. Then network analysis focuses on collecting and examining network traffic. An examiner reviews transaction logs and uses real-time monitoring to find evidence. Organizations often use this type of analysis to investigate incidents. So computer forensics is a fairly new field. It's only a few decades old. It's growing quickly. In 1984, the U.S. Federal Bureau of Investigations, or FBI, began creating software programs to collect computer evidence. In 1990, International Association of Computer Investigation Specialists, or IACIS, was formed. The IACIS is the oldest computer forensic professional group, the first group to use the phrase computer forensics. First International Conference of Computer Forensics was held in 1993. In 1995, the International Organization on Computer Evidence, or IOCE, was formed. The IOCE creates guiding principles for computer forensic examiners. The IOCE is an international organization of law enforcement agencies. 
U.S. arm of the IOCE is the Scientific Working Group on Digital Evidence. Computer forensics examiners find evidence on electronic devices collected for both civil and criminal cases. They must collect evidence in a scientific manner regardless of the underlying case. You also must have a full understanding of various technologies, hardware, and software. An examiner helps answer who, what, where, when, why, and how. Computer forensic examiner must have the following traits. A sound knowledge of computing technologies, use of scientific method to conduct repeatable and verifiable examinations, and understanding of the laws of evidence and legal procedure. You must also have access to computer forensic tools and the skill to use them and outstanding record keeping skills. No matter how careful they are, people always leave traces of, of their activities when they interact with other people and with their surroundings. This is the basic principle of forensic science. It's known as low cards exchange principle. It applies to the digital world and the physical world. If people attempt to steal electronic information or delete incriminating files, they leave electronic traces of their activities. For example, log information can document these activities. The computer forensic examiner needs to know how to find this trace evidence material. This evidence is used to help provide a person's prove a person's actions in a computer system. Computer forensic examiners do more than turn on a computer and search through files. They must perform complex data recovery procedures. In particular, they must protect the data on an electronic device, avoid deleting, damaging, or altering data in any way on an electronic device, make exact copies of electronic data without altering the original device, discover normal, deleted, password protected, hidden, and encrypted files, study data to create timelines of electronic activities, identify files and data that may be relevant to a case, fully document all evidence collection activities, and provide expert testimony on the steps taken to recover digital evidence. Computer forensic examiners must have special skills, and skills beyond those of a traditional information security professional. All requires that computer forensic examiners be competent at what they do. Examiners can show that they are comp competent by earning advanced degrees. They also can become certified. Since the profession is still new, there are many computer forensic certificates to choose from. Both independent organizations and vendors offer them. So chain of custody. Chain of custody is an important evidence concept. Courts and attorneys use a chain of custody document to help prove that evidence is admissible. The chain of custody document shows who obtains evidence, where and when it was obtained, who secured it, who had control or possession of it, used to prove the evidence is reliable. Evidence is reliable when it's not destroyed, changed, or altered. It can't be modified after it's originally collected. The court may find evidence isn't admissible in court if its chain of custody is poorly documented or incomplete. Chain of custody protects the integrity of evidence. The chain of custody documents how evidence is collected, used, and handled without throughout the lifetime of a particular case. It's a journal that records every interaction that a person or object has with the evidence. The court proceedings. It's important that evidence used in court case be admissible. A judge or jury can consider only admissible evidence when they decide cases. Evidence that is invalid for some reason is called inadmissible evidence. Inadmissible evidence can't be presented to a judge or jury. A judge or jury who accidentally hears about that evidence cannot consider it later in deliberations. Admissible evidence is good evidence. Inadmissible evidence is bad evidence. 
the examiner must gather evidence in a way that makes it admissible in court. Evidence is useful only if it is admissible. To be admissible, evidence must be collected in a lawful way, and it must be collected in a scientific manner. For digital evidence, it means that the computer forensic examiner conducts a repeatable and verifiable examination of an electronic device. The examiner must use established practice and procedures. The examiner also must be able to explain the results of his or her work to a client, judge, or jury in a clear way. So guiding principles for forensic examination. Computer forensics examiners all follow some common principles. The International Organization of Computer Evidence has created the most well-known set of principles they created in 1999. They are, examiners must not change digital evidence after they seize it. If original uh, digital evidence must be assessed, the person assessing it must be competent. All digital evidence handled must be fully documented and available for review. Each person who handles digital evidence is responsible for it while it's in his or her possession. And any agency that handles digital evidence must comply with these principles. There are special rules for collecting and handling digital evidence. However, the processes for obtaining the electronic devices and evidence on them in the first place must follow established legal principles. Law asks two basic questions about evidence. Did the person or organization that collected the evidence have the legal authority to do so? Is the evidence admissible in court? Legal principles and statutes are used to address the first question. These laws focus on the situation where a private entity or the government can collect information about a person. Court rules and case laws case law are used to address the second question. Both the federal government and state governments have trial court rules for civil and criminal proceedings. In addition to these rules, the federal and state courts have evidentiary rules. Evidentiary rules govern how parties introduce evidence at trials. This chapter uses the federal rules of evidence to illustrate admissible requirements. Many states have evidence rules based on federal rules of evidence. The Fourth Amendment. The Fourth Amendment to the Constitution protects people from unreasonable government search and seizure. Search happens when a person's reasonable expectation of privacy in a place or thing is compromised. A seizure happens when the government interferes with a person's property. Interference includes taking the property or using it in such a way that the person who owns it can't use it. Fourth Amendment states that the government may not search or seize areas and things in which a person has a reasonable expectation of privacy. If a person has a reasonable expectation of privacy in a place or item, then the government must get a search warrant before searching it or taking it. Under the Fourth Amendment, the government includes law enforcement. The session uses the terms government and law enforcement interchangeably. Several court cases have held that people have a reasonable expectation of privacy in their personal computers and mobile devices. The U.S. Court of Appeals for North Ninth Circuit has found that a person with a reasonable expectation of privacy in a personal computer. Cases called United States versus Heckenkamp. Other courts have held that people have the reasonable expectation of privacy in data stored on personal pagers. In searching these devices, law enforcement must get a search warrant. To get a search warrant, the law enforcement must specify the criminal activity that is being investigated, must describe where the search will take place, and must list the items that will be searched. Finally, law enforcement must state the evidence that they expect to find. They also must state how the evidence relates to the criminal activity that is being investigated. If law enforcement conducts a search without a valid warrant, then any evidence that it finds isn't admissible in court. 
That means that a judge won't allow the government to use the evidence to prove his case. Although, rule, although the rule is strict, there are some exceptions. Federal laws regarding electronic data collection. Three main federal laws govern the collection of electronic communication data. These laws cover many different communications and include email, radio, electronic communications, data transmissions, and telephone calls. Computer forensic examiners often study these communications when they investigate cases or events. An examiner must make sure that his or her actions follow the law. These laws forbid the use of eavesdropping technologies. This means that the government individuals and private entities must use certain technologies to snoop on electronic communications. Only time use of these technologies is allowed is when the law says it's allowed. Usually this is when the law allows an exception or if an entity has a court order. The three laws are the Crimes Communications Privacy Act, the Wiretap Act, and the Pen Register Trap and Trace Statute. The Electronic Communications Privacy Act governs the use, disclosure, and interception of stored electronic communications. It was passed in 1986. Congress has amended it several times. The Electronic Communications Privacy Act governs access to contents of stored communications as well as access to transmission data about the communications. Transmission data includes the header, log data. The Electronic Communication Privacy Act doesn't apply to real-time collection of electronic communications. The Wiretap Act. The ECPA applies to access to disclosure of stored communication only. The Federal Wiretap Act governs real-time interception of the contents of an electronic communication. The act doesn't apply to transmission information. It applies to anyone who intentionally intercepts or tries to intercept any wire, oral, or electronic communication. The act forbids the real-time interception of these communications. Communications covered by the act includes email, radio communications, data transmissions, and telephone calls. The pen, register, and trap and trace statute. The Wiretap Act governs real-time interception of contents of a communication. It doesn't apply to transmission information. The pen, register, trap, and trace statute governs real-time monitoring of this type of data. Transmission information includes headers, logs, network routing, and other transmission data. This law doesn't apply to communications content. Under the pen, register, and trap and trace statute, no one is allowed to use pen, register, or trap and trace devices to intercept electronic communication transmission data. Like the Wiretap Act, some exceptions allow the use of these devices. For example, the law allows law enforcement to install pen, register, or trap and trace devices if they have a court order to do so. Admissibility of evidence. Even if evidence is lawfully collected, it still must be admissible. At the federal level, the main guidance regarding the admission of evidence at trial is the federal rules of evidence. The federal rules of evidence apply to use of evidence at federal trials. Many states also have rules of evidence. Often these rules are based on the federal rules. One thing to keep in mind whenever you are reviewing evidence is that you need to understand whether you must follow state rules or federal rules. Under the federal rules of evidence, evidence Relevant evidence is admissible unless some other rule or law applies that it's not. Admissible evidence is evidence that the judge and jury can consider when they are deliberating about a case. Evidence can be either inculpatory and exculpatory, 
inculpatory evidence supports or informs a given theory. Exculpatory evidence rebuts or contradicts a given theory. So in summary, computer forensics is the scientific process of collecting and examining data stored on electronic devices. The data is examined to find evidence about an event or a crime. Evidence found on electronic devices is called digital evidence. The traditional forms of evidence, digital evidence, is subject to rules that govern how it can be used later. If digital evidence isn't properly collected, it can't be used in court. Computer forensic examiners collect digital evidence using special programs and tools. They must collect the evidence carefully to make sure that it's not changed. Examiners often have, often have special skills, must have a thorough knowledge of computing technologies. They also must understand the scientific method. Finally, examiners must be familiar with the law and evidence rules. Thank you.